welcome everybody to fall and to September's community forum from the Academy for Addiction and Mental Health Nutrition. I see that we have returning members of our community as well as some new faces, as well as some new students. So welcome to you all, so glad you're here. The format of this particular get together, which is recorded and does get posted on YouTube. So if for whatever reason um, that makes you uncomfortable, we can block out your name or your face or whatever. So just let me know if that makes you uncomfortable. Um, because this is a way for us to get wonderful information out to the world. We're gonna start with very brief introductions. Your name, what you do, where you're from, and perhaps one question. And then I will teach a little bit about um, today's topic of sugar addiction. So I'm gonna teach a little bit about the use of amino acids with sugar addiction in particular and other addictive disorders as well. And then we will open this up to questions, comments, and success stories. This is a time to share whatever successes you have had in your own life, in your communities, in your with your clients, so that we can all celebrate along with you. As most of you know, I'm Christina Veselak. In Colorado, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and I'm a certified nutritionist. I live in West Virginia where I have a small private practice as an online mental health nutrition coach and relapse prevention specialist. I also am founder and director of the Academy for Addiction and Mental Health Nutrition. Sue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Varney. Uh, I live in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm a traditional naturopath with a specialty in nutrition. Um, I'm also a licensed massage therapist and esthetician and educator. Thank you, Sue. And Sue is currently a student. Melanie. Hi. Yes, my name is Melanie Tuskia and um, I'm, it's uh, about three o'clock in the morning here in New Zealand. Um, I'm calling in from Auckland, New Zealand. And um, I am not a health practitioner. I'm a landscape gardener, but I have a huge interest in um, the amino acids and, um, and, and working with them and um, helping my friends and family. And it's very nice to meet you, Christina. <laughs> very nice to meet you too, Melanie. Thank you so much for getting up at three o'clock in the morning to be with us. <laughs> Hopefully we'll no be problems. able to, to, to um, have more conversations. Pamela, unmute please. Good there you go. Morning. Um, I am a registered nurse uh, with many, many years of experience, and I'm a new student of Christina's. I, um, I'm kind of in between jobs, trying to figure out what my next specialty uh, is in nursing. I've done a lot of different things, but um, I'm interested in nutrition and supplements and, and supporting folks that are trying to make changes. Well, welcome. So glad to have you with us, Pam. Thank you. And I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas. Little Rock, Arkansas. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Valsa. You may need to unmute. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Valsa Madhava. I'm in New York. I am an internal medicine physician and also a functional medicine practitioner. I took Christina's class a few years ago and incorporate uh, amino acids in, uh, in what I do. Excuse me for not showing my face. I'm in my workout clothes. <laughs> so uh, anyway, nice meeting you all. Welcome, Valsa. And I'm sure we wouldn't mind, but I understand. Okay, Gerald. 
Hi, my name is Gerald McKenna. I'm a retired licensed mental health counselor and a recovering alcoholic. Um, I've put together about 14,000 days without a drink, but less than 20 minutes since I had some sugar. <laughs> ah, got it. So I think my addiction to sugar is a little tougher than the one I had to <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> and I'm hoping to learn how to maybe kick the habit. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, welcome, Gerald. Thank you. Eileen. Unmute. Come on. Sorry, it wouldn't do it. Hi, I'm Elena. I'm in Oakland, California. And um, I have my, my NE certificate from Bowman College in 2007 and work in a woman-owned uh, independent uh, health food store and marketplace for the last 13 years in the <laughs> wellness department and um, have been following Christina and Julia Ross and Gant and all those people since back in 2006 and seven, but I'm finally just started taking Christina's course. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Elena. And I'm so glad you're in our course. I'm glad to be here. Laura. Hello, good morning. Hello everyone, I'm Laura Lee, I'm in Oklahoma City. And um, I am also a recovering alcoholic. Um, and I just lost my mom a year ago to alcoholism. And my brother committed suicide four uh, nine months ago uh, from being an alcoholic. Whoa. And so I'm very, I'm very passionate about uh, what Christine is doing with this program because um, I feel like biochemistry is the missing link in addiction. And um, I just am so blessed to be here and excited about the future. <laughs> Welcome, Laura. And Laura is a current student as well. Jen. Good morning. I'm a former student of Christina's. I did level one and two, and it's like life changing. I'm in long term recovery from alcohol myself and uh, working on prevention with my daughter. And I work in the field professionally, and I'm in Arcata, California. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome, Jen. So glad you're with us. Lauren. Unmute, please. There we go. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm here for my personal health and for the health of my family through the work of Julie Ross and Jim Matthews Larson and, and the things I've learned online from Christina. I discovered that I have a lifelong or a condition called pyrrole disorder and how basically zinc and other micronutrients have absolutely changed my life the backstory is i certainly am an adult child of an alcoholic i grew up around alcoholism and the sort of the more current story is one of my four children almost died from alcoholism but that's not my story to share without permission and so i'm just happy to learn all i can about how to feed my brain and teach my loved ones how they can feed their brain. Yeah. Yay, yay. More power to you, Lauren, and so glad you're with us. Kimberly, unmute, please, and introduce yourself very briefly. Hi, I'm Kimberly. I'm in Colorado and um, an LPC using uh, lots of amino acids and supplements with my clients. All right, welcome. And a former student. Yes. Uh, Mark. And by the way, Mark, thank you so much. We, um, I just want to appreciate the uh, picture that you have up for We Remember 9-11. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've been uh, watching the... Uh memorial services uh, in the states today so my heart's with you all um 
see our Mark Style sat on uh, in uh, uh, just outside London in the United Kingdom, waving the flag for the academy in the UK. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a uh, former student and uh, uh, certified alumni from the Academy uh, and I also work with Christina um, in, in the role as um, uh, collaborations director for the Academy. I just think the work that we can do individually, uh, but also the work we can do collaboratively is super life changing. So, yeah, great to be here. Mm. Welcome. Glad you are, Mark. Okay, Heidi. Good morning. I'm keeping my camera off. I'm still in my PJs. <laughs> I'm uh, happy to be here, though. I'm, a, I'm uh, in long-term recovery also. I struggle with some sugar issues on and off, and I'm an acupuncturist professionally um, and a certified nutritionist and a former student of the Academy. Happy to be here. And Heidi lives in New Hampshire. Welcome, Heidi. Glad you're with us today. Dylan. Hey, everyone. My name is Dylan. I'm also in recovery and uh, currently in level two with Christina and the rest of uh, the level two crew. And just uh, looking forward to learning a little bit more and being here today. I live out in uh, Massachusetts on the East Coast of the U.S. Welcome, Dylan. Jeff. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Jones. I'm in Colorado. Um, I'm an LPC. I have known Christina for maybe eight years or so and um, <clears throat> I am a current level two student. Um, for the last probably decade, my focus has been working with um, the family um, the family with an addicted loved one, um, and actually within the last, I don't know, three, four months or something like that, I've been working with Mark Stiles here who has really helped me incorporate the biochemical piece, um, piece into family healing. And so one of the things that I say and think about a lot is, um, supporting families to enable health as opposed to enabling old patterns that reinforce addiction. So that's a little bit about me. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. The sugar piece is something that I just see more and more. And what really blows my mind is that people um, don't see that as a problem until it's a big problem. And warning signs a lot of times are not enough. But anyhow, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Jeff. And Jeff is in our level two as well. Dylan. You may need to... <laughs> Dylan, you may need to unmute. <laughs> and Gerald, please, un please mute. Thank you. All right, Christine, can you say that one more time? Yes, okay, you're unmuted now. Please introduce yourself briefly and where you're from. Oh, we, we did that already. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sean, that's what I meant to say. Please unmute yourself and briefly introduce yourself and where you're from. All right, so welcome everybody. The topic is sugar addiction and it's a crucial topic because, well, for a number of reasons. One is sugar is ubiquitous. It is now very inexpensive. It certainly didn't used to be, but it now is. It is to be found all around the world. Um, Sugar companies and food companies are putting a lot of money into marketing uh, sugar products and packaging them in such a way as to fire our dopamine and make us want more and more and more. Sugar is an addictive drug, totally in its own right. 
And partly because of that, many, many people in recovery from other substance use disorders and process disorders switch addictions to sugar, both in early recovery and late recovery as well, because it works initially as a mind altering chemical, just like everything else does until tolerance builds up. And um, many people in many treatment programs do not recognize it for the problem it is. So I was at a uh, treatment conference, recovery conference, several years ago, and I was going around. I have a flyer that says, with beautiful picture of candy on it, have you switched addictions? And I was sort of going around and chatting up people at different tables and from different treatment programs. And one young lady got very angry at me for suggesting that there was a problem with sugar and said, how dare you tell me that I, was, I am doing my recovery wrong? I get to do my recovery any way I want. And um, I, I tried to, you know, respond in a nice way, but, but she was incensed. And unfortunately, it reminded me a little bit of how people in active addiction um, become when family members suggest that there might be a problem that this extreme defensiveness pops up because you see the brain is in the middle of an experience of needing the substance to survive. You see, this is where this pushback comes from. This, this defensiveness, this minimization, this denial is because the brain, once tolerance begins and neurotransmitters start depleting, the brain actually is becoming dependent upon the substance to um, work more optimally. And in late stage addiction with certain substances to work at all. So yes, indeed, in for people with late stage alcohol use disorder, if they stop abruptly, people may die. People in later stage benzodiazepine dependency, if they stop a benzo drug abruptly, they may indeed die. So the brain is not wrong in, in this de defensive need to protect itself and its supply of what is keeping it functioning. And I think this is very important for everybody who works with families to understand because families don't get it. People who have not had an active addiction or an active dependency upon a substance or behavior do not realize that there's something real about the physiological need going on, okay? It's not just a psychological need. It's not, as we all know, as simple as, well, just stop. But a lot of families don't understand this and need to be explained. It, it, and, and they need to have people very compassionately explain to them that the brain actually changes once it's been exposed to these substances. And there are stages of addiction. And we do go absolutely into physiological withdrawal when we start to stop a substance. Mm -hmm. So this is true with sugar as well. And I felt very sad for this woman because she immediately became defensive because of this and therefore wasn't able to recognize that she had just switched addictions and that she was still depleting her neurotransmitters by her sugar use, which it seems was extensive. 
And while she was working a solid recovery program in a lot of ways, she was not working a biochemical recovery program. And that's what we're all about. And so my guess is, is that her life was not as serene as it could be. That she probably was having mood swings. She probably was having behavioral swings. She probably was having adverse consequences to her sugar use that she was not ready to identify and see. So that when I came up and said, um, there may be a problem here, her claws came out. It's very hard to know kind of where to go next in a conversation about sugar addiction because there are so many different factors to it. But as I do in my advanced class, I want to just um, remind ourselves as to the criteria by which we call anything an addiction. Okay? Um, you know, th th this word gets thrown around and gets used sometimes wisely and sometimes not wisely. Um, but there is actually a long definition of addiction, which I'm not going to go into. But there are five or six cri diagnostic criteria that we use to call anything an addiction, to identify its process. And the first one, as I mentioned, is the buildup of tolerance, which means that the more you use the substance, the more depleted your neurotransmitters get, and you need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. Well, sugar is interesting in this regard because sugar, like alcohol, THC, and nicotine, fire whichever neurotransmitters are needed in the moment. So people will eat sugar for energy and to wake up. And for some people it works. People will um, eat sugar to relax, to calm down, to nurture themselves, to get sleepy. And for many people, most of all, for comfort, because one of the things that sugar powerfully fires because it gets into those receptor sites actually is um, the endorphins. This is probably one of the reasons why people with an um, opioid use disorder really like sugar because it supports it. It, it stays in those receptors, um, keeps firing them and it helps reduce withdrawal, but it just can numb us out and can comfort us and can be our best friend. You know, I don't know if any of you read romance novels, I do occasionally, um, but frequently there is the pint of chocolate ice cream that is mentioned by the protagonist when her love life is in trouble. And I think many of us um, can identify with that. So we have tolerance, we have withdrawal, which means that when um, we remove the substance, we have a physiological and typically psychological or emotional response. I think withdrawal for sugar in human beings is probably a little different depending upon what we're using it for, which neurotransmitters we're particularly using it to fire because the withdrawal effect is gonna be the opposite of what we're using it for. In rats, one of the ways that they've determined, researchers have determined that sugar fires our opioids, our endorphins, 
is by getting um, rats addicted to sugar and then withdrawing the sugar. And what they found is that the rat's behavior, their little jaws chatter and their forepaws tremble and they do other things that are identical to the symptoms of their withdrawal from opioids when they've gotten these rats um, physically dependent upon opioid medications that the withdrawal from sugar is identical. So we've got the physiological withdrawal. We have, um, well, it's progressive. That's the part of tolerance. It has negative consequences. So what are some of the negative consequences of sugar addiction? Mood swings, because blood sugar is going up and down and therefore adrenaline is going up and down. A lowered immune system, obesity, type two diabetes. So a very simple way to think of addiction is that it is a pathological relationship with a substance behavior place or thing that is progressive and potentially fatal. So we know that sugar can become, is potentially um, fatal. Valsa, it's on our website, the study. Um, at least I think it is. I'll check and make sure. People can die from cancer, from sugar. People can die from obesity. And people can die from type 2 diabetes. One of the criteria is continued use despite negative consequences. And this is part of loss of control. So loss of control is part of, is one of the diagnostic categories. And we can have loss of control in so, so, so many different ways. Okay. Um, it can be, I'm just gonna have one cookie and I end up eating the entire box. I could just have one piece of cake and I eat the whole one and I'm looking for a second one. It could be, you know, I can't have breakfast without my Danish. I can't have coffee without sugar in it. And then there's three teaspoons of sugar put in my morning cup of coffee. You know, so when I'm asked people for their three-day food diary, you know, they say coffee in the morning, I always ask, well, how much coffee and what do you put in it? Well, I put sugar in it. Okay, great. How much sugar do you put in it? And um, sometimes people can tell the truth and sometimes they can't just with any other substance. So these are some of the criteria that we look for in determining whether somebody or not has an addictive relationship with a substance. And of course, we can misuse a substance, we can overuse a substance without actually being in an addictive relationship with it. So that would be where we don't have tolerance, we don't have withdrawal, we don't have loss of control over different domains, um, we don't have uh, potentially fatal consequences because sooner or later we get the message and we have choice. So one of the differences between just misuse and dependency is the loss of choice. With misuse or overuse of sugar, once we start having negative consequences, we get the message and we back out. Okay, I used to run DUI groups. And we had two groups of people in there. We had those who made non-smart decisions, otherwise known as stupid, and got caught and made absolutely sure that they didn't ever, ever, ever do that again. 
Okay. They still had choice. They still had control. Now, then there were the people who said, okay, fine. I'm never, ever going to do this again. I just won't drive when I drink. Well, okay. Um, because then you had the other group of people who were in their fourth DUI group or their sixth DUI group and were actually um, in serious legal problems because they were caught driving drunk without a license. Um, so, you know, we, all of us, when we start noticing that we are turning more and more to one way of soothing ourselves, one way of relaxing, one way of mood altering. We have to keep an eye open for um, the beginnings of loss of control and loss of choice. Because it's this loss of choice that's the defining mark between misuse and dependency where we no longer have it, it has us. There is a lot of biochemical complexity with sugar dependency and sugar craving, which I don't thoroughly understand. It's, it's not really been an area of expertise. Um, but for those of you who are interested in knowing more, you can connect with me and I'll, I'll share some of the um, resources that I've come across where you can really understand biochemically what's going on um, much deeper. Now, in terms of recovery, I know that everybody's interested in, in the recovery piece of this. What is one of the very, very first things we need to do? And that is, as with any addictive disorder, you need to be clear on what the sugar does for you, at least at the beginning. Once, you know, tolerance has really um, built up, we just start using the substances to function, to feel okay, because we have to. It no longer effectively works in mood altering. So you want to ask somebody or you want to ask yourself, when I first started using the substance, when I first started really loving sugar, what did, I, what did it do for me? What, what do I like about it? Why do I turn to it? What do I hope? It may not be doing it for me anymore, but what do I hope it'll do for me? Because that will tell you which neurotransmitter system it is predominantly firing. So Julia Ross's book, The Mood Cure, is all about that. Wonderful book. And it's all about figuring out which neurotransmitter system um, is, being, um, is being fired. And therefore, which neurotransmitter system needs to be supported with amino acids. Because I said I would talk about amino acids and sugar addiction. So here we are. So we use the amino acids to rebuild the neurotransmitter system, to reduce cravings, and to reduce withdrawal, and to rebuild the brain's functioning to feed the starving brain so that we don't crave any substance, so that we don't need to switch addictions. Okay, so that we've brought in the third leg of the recovery stool and our recovery feels stable. We can breathe. We can flow with stress. We can be okay. But for as, as many of you know, you know, my motto is it's our brain's job to allow us to cope with stress gracefully. But to do that, it needs to be fed optimally. So with sugar addiction, as with any other, it's where's the deficit? What's missing? Where, what is the hole that you're trying to fill with the sugar? And this is where the questionnaires in Julie's books come in useful and the amino acid therapy chart that she um, 
created and is so generous to share with all of us that we now have a digital version of, and um, you can connect with Mark or I for information about how you can be using this digital version in your practice. So we use the chart to determine um, which neurotransmitter systems are hurting the most. And some people, you have nines and tens across the board. Typically, when I see nines and tens across the board, where people are just emotionally struggling in every area of their well-being, it's because they just simply aren't eating and digesting enough protein in general, because all of our neurotransmitters, as well as our skin, our muscles, our blood, everything else is made out of amino acids. Well, if we're not eating enough protein, the body's going to use the aminos to stay alive, not to feed, um, sufficiently feed the neurotransmitters. And so we're going to have mood and behavioral issues across the board. And so this is where, for some people, the very first number one thing you do it's just start eating at least 15 to 20 grams, if not more, protein every three to four hours. This keeps blood sugar stable. This provides enough aminos to keep your heart beating and your neurotransmitters happy. Now, of course, this protein needs to be digested. And if you have digestive issues, if you get full very quickly, if the idea of eating all that protein kind of makes you a little nauseated, um, then, or if you, you know, literally just get heartburn or stomach issues after you eat a lot of protein, then you need to find a practitioner, a functional medical practitioner who can help support your digestion help you make enough hydrochloric acid or bring it in from outside so that you actually are optimally digesting and absorbing your, hydro, your uh, protein. So we need the protein, we need the vitamins and minerals from our fruits and veggies or a good solid vitamin pill. You know, there are a few other things we need. So we need the foundation in place, right? And once the foundation's in place, then you redo the chart and see what numbers are still high. Or if you have been eating enough protein, um, you only maybe have one section of the chart where your numbers are high. Well, this tells you uh, where the neurotransmitter depletion really is, and perhaps it's genetic. And this is where we bring in the amino acids to quickly rebuild that neurotransmitter system. So for people who are using sugar for comfort, to numb out, to help with grief, to help with loss, then we'll bring in the amino acid D-phenylalanine maybe even a thousand milligrams three times a day, which is a significant dose. Some people need that much, maybe less. And that can bring, uh, that can help with uh, loneliness, with grief, it can take the edge off. I've heard Julia recently say that she finds that most of her sugar addicts actually require significant dosing of d -phenylalanine. Has anybody else heard that from Julia as well? What was the dose you just mentioned, Christina? Did you say 1,500? Well, so a high dose of d -phenylalanine would be 1,000 milligrams of just it straight three times a day. Okay. Okay, a lot of people don't need that much. 500 milligrams three times a day is, you know, enough for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Now, you have to order d online. You can't order it. Um, you can't buy it over the counter. Oh, so not DP, not DLPA, just DPA? Right. DPA, you have to order online. Yeah. Now, DLPA 
you can um, walk into a vitamin store and buy. The difference between the two is that it contains um, its mirror image, L-phenylalanine, which is a dopamine support. So it can reduce um, depression, give you brightness, energy, motivation, and drive. And, you know, we often need that when we're sad and grieving or lonely or numb. So this is where the combination DLPA is very useful. It's 50% each. So you can get 1,000 milligrams of DLPA and that will give you 500 megs of each and you can do it a rising late morning, mid-afternoon, which would be, you know, a typical dose for a lot of people. Glutamine is also often recommended for sugar craving and craving for other substances as well when the cravings come from low blood sugar. So if we're used to eating a lot of sugar, we end up eating it throughout the day. And this is also simple carbohydrates because blood sugar goes up, blood sugar goes down, adrenaline kicks in. We crave sugar, blood sugar goes up, blood sugar goes down, adrenaline kicks in, we feel awful, we crave sugar, and yo-yo all throughout the day. Glutamine is very helpful when your cravings is due to low blood sugar because it feeds the prefrontal cortex. It appears to turn off the adrenaline rush and can be very effective in stopping a craving both for sugar and other substances as well. So you can pour a little bit in water, put it in your mouth, swish it around. You can swallow it. There's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, some people just open the capsule and dump it under their tongue. I personally don't like that because I end up spraying white powder everywhere. <laughs> but that's me. Other people do just fine with it. Christine, what's a good dose for that to start off with for sugar, sugar cravings? For the glutamine? Yeah, for the glutamine, yeah. A thousand milligrams, either just dose it between meals or take it when you have a craving. Okay. And is there, do you prefer, I know you prefer uh, putting it in water, but is it, is it, is there one more effective than the other just based on the no. individual's preference? Okay. That's just your preference. You know, just as long as you have sustained contact with your mucosal membrane, it's going to absorb quickly through your mouth. You cool. can swallow it. It's just going to take a little longer for it to get into effect. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's all remember because it just popped into my mind that alcohol itself is not a sugar. It is not a sugar and it does not raise blood alcohol level, uh, blood sugar levels. It will raise blood alcohol levels, but it won't raise blood sugar levels. In fact, it lowers them. And one of the reasons and, and the reasons why we crave sugar when we crave alcohol, when our blood sugar drops is not because it's a sugar. Okay, there are other reasons, but that is not the reason. Everybody clear on that? Christina, I have a question about that. Yes. What about wine? Because it's made from fruit. Well. And fruit all, is a- All, yeah, all, of, all, all of your alcohols are originally made from a carbohydrate source. Beer and wine, um, still do have some sugar in them and the sugar in them because it's not distilled, it's not 100% fermented, so there is still some sugar left in them. And yes, that sugar may raise your blood sugar levels and it does have a number on the glycemic index. So Christina, another question. So if alcohol is not, doesn't act like a sugar, so why do alcoholics benefit from or I should say the flip side, when someone is low in blood sugar, when they reach for the alcohol, it sort of mitigates their symptoms. Mm -hmm. A couple of reasons. And then, let, me, let me see if I can, I can remember them right now.
the body can use alcohol as an energy source, but it is not an effective energy source. But um, the body will do it, and it's it's possible that that energy, you know, increase in energy from how the uh, citric acid cycle utilizes alcohol will turn off the adrenaline response. Um, but because alcohol is firing all your other neurotransmitters, you're going to be feeling better just because it's firing your um, other neurotransmitters. And typically, Valsa, while there are certainly people who just drink straight shots of pure distilled alcohol, um, absolutely they do. Many, many people are more likely to go for a mixed drink or wine or beer. Um, and the mixed drink will have soda in it or orange juice in it or sugar in it or, or, or. And that, you know, will immediately raise your blood sugar levels. Does that answer that question? It's sort of, but also in the hospital, when someone goes into the hospital, they, they're not using alcohol anymore, but they want the sugar. And that sort of helps with... Um, I guess it's the flip side. It's like the sugar helps with the alcohol. But my original question to you was alcohol and sugar. Right. Well, so in the hospital, what do they use sugar for? Patients just ask for a lot of sugar for just like when they're withdrawing, right? They use sugar. Yeah. Because yeah. it's feeding their neurotransmitters. Because it feed, yeah, because it's firing and feeding the neurotransmitters, Paulsa. Huh? Right. That no, I was actually asking my original question was the other way, you know, people using um, alcohol when their sugar is low and not realizing it, that there, you know, the other reasons for having low right. blood sugar and using alcohol for it. Well, exactly. And when blood sugar drops, um, we're going to crave, no matter what our substance of choice is. Okay, everybody remember that? Um, so it could be, it could be alcohol, it could be cocaine, it could be THC, it could be nicotine, it could be whatever, but when our blood sugar is low, we are going to reach for our substance of choice. We're going to crave it. This first started getting noticed with alcohol, and this is why initially it was believed, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Alcohol is a sugar, blood sugar drops, we reach for alcohol. So I used to believe that too, and that's what I was taught. And so when I put together my very first hypoglycemia lecture, it was like, okay, well, alcohol is a sugar, so it's got to have a number on the glycemic index. And I went, you know, to the first website to find the glycemic index number of your various distilled alcohols, and it was zero. And I thought, oh, there's something wrong with the website. So I went to the next website, zero. Okay, third website, zero. And it's like, okay, something's wrong with my theory. Um, now, when I've talked to registered dietitians, they are taught this from day one. So they know it. It's just us alcoholism counselors <laughs> that didn't know it. Um, we crave sugar or when blood sugar drops, we crave our um, substance of choice for three reasons. First of all, when blood sugar drops, adrenaline kicks in, destabilizes us, because that's what adrenaline does. And we have a conditioned response to reach for our substance of choice to bring our brain back to homeostasis. This has been well studied and well understood. So destabilization, we want to restabilize, we use our substance of choice for that. Secondly, low blood sugar reduces the amount of fuel getting to the prefrontal cortex. Our willpower lives, apparently, according to research, in our prefrontal cortex. We have low blood sugar, willpower goes on vacation. So we're destabilized. We want to reach for our substance of choice and willpower has gone bye-bye. 
And the third thing is that under the influence of adrenaline, our prefrontal cortex itself goes bye-bye. Okay, we just lose access to our executive functioning skills. We lose access to our recovery skills. We lose access, not just to the ability to say no, but to the ability to remember why we want to say no. Okay, this is a lot of material. I've just turned into a very short space of time, but is everybody kind of following me here? Anybody have any other questions or want me to slow down a little bit? You can slow down. <laughs> so the, <laughs> so the, pre, the prefrontal cortex, you're saying when blood sugar is low, that affects the prefrontal cortex directly and directly. causes it to just not be able to function as well? or, or yeah, because, Yes, for two reasons. One, it needs fuel. And when blood sugar is low, it's not getting fed. And secondly, um, when blood sugar is low, we get an adrenaline surge. And when we're in sympathetic arousal, the prefrontal uh, cortex um, is not as active and available. And Kimberly, you may want to go back and re-listen to the lecture on my lecture on hypoglycemia or look at those slides. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I am going to stop talking. And I now I just want to open it up to all of you for questions, discussion, experiences, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. It's your turn. I, I would just say, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, I feel like I should know this already, but when we want to help somebody who's craving alcohol in particular, mm -hmm. Um, in addition to stabilizing their blood sugar with protein and possibly glutamine, mm -hmm. is there, is there something I mean, especially since alcohol isn't really feeding the sugar, uh, isn't really a sugar, is there, what else would we use or, or do we have to determine why they're using the alcohol? You, you, you have to determine why. So that's again, where you use the chart, Heidi. Okay, so there's not a there's not an easy if this then that on that one. No, okay. because because alcohol like sugar fires across the board, so people use it for different reasons and to fire different um, substances. So Val, so this is another answer to your question. Is because sugar will fire dopamine and norepinephrine, they can have more energy and feel better. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Does that answer that for you, Heidi, as well? Yes, thanks. So we just, we really have to tease it out and see um, how to support them based on what they're using it for. You really do. Yes. Yeah. Cocaine, cocaine is much easier. Okay. Because so we know cocaine just works on one neurotransmitter system. So the ones that mm -hmm. act on multiple are alcohol, sugar, THC, and nicotine. Yes. So those always need to be teased out in terms of what they're being used for. Exactly. Got it. And, and what they are being used for when. So oh. somebody will have their morning smoke to wake up. So it fires dopamine. And they're bed their evening smoke to fire serotonin or melatonin and GABA and put them to sleep. Does it fire differently for different people? Yes. Mm -hmm, I would think so, yeah. Yeah. Christina, when I, when I have trouble is when my clients can't tease it out, like they're just not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where you just bring in the chart, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. And if your numbers are high across the board, then you bring that's in the all. different aminos, right. you know, during mm -hmm. the day when you need them and you really trial and you have your client's trial. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. 
And it, 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 this is where it takes time and patience and working together. Yeah. And if your clients are really, really impatient, you may lose them, unfortunately. Um, but most people are willing to work with you around this. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dylan, you were trying to say something. Yeah, just around uh, the intensity of sugar withdrawal. Like I'm, I'm, I went through recovery from hardcore drug addiction. So that was, for me, that was alcohol and drinking a lot, like about a liter of vodka a day and also uh, crack addiction. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I bring that up is in the context of sugar addiction, sugar was, you know, I would say very close, if not just as hard as going through those uh, withdrawals. You know, and so having that awareness, I think is really important because a lot of people, including myself, didn't realize the hold that it had, mm -hmm. you know, and being able to have that support through this type of stuff, but also just the awareness of this is a period of time that might require toning it down in other areas of life for a little bit to get through this initial withdrawal period, you know, even, even the last thing I'll say, even uh, Tim Grover, who was Michael Jordan's coach. Mm -hmm. He said, if you want to see what somebody is made of, watch them get off sugar <laughs> because he'll, he'll, he'll bring all of his, all of his, uh, clients. He won't, he'll get them off sugar. That's like one of the first things he does. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, and Mark, you have a coming off sugar story, don't you? He's, do we have Mark? Not at the moment. Okay. Um, Christine, do you, I have a question. Um, yeah. So, so with artificial sweeteners, um, stevia is supposed to be a natural one. Mm -hmm. and I found that I'm using it more and more for my tea, and so uh, supposedly the research I've done is that it it um, activates on your taste buds, but as far as firing the neurotransmitters in your brain, it doesn't necessarily do that, or does anybody have any experience or uh, knowledge about that? Go for it, Elena. I don't, I don't have, well, I don't have any technical uh, research knowledge, but experience-wise, um, stevia, I think, is a healthy sweetener that I despise. Um, it's in almost every everything. And I'm a protein powder queen because people on the go, you don't have to chew it. And they're almost all sweetened with stevia. Um, I have never found over some years now that it increases my cravings for my weakness is bread, you know, good carbs, <laughs> much more than sugar, sugar. There were sugar, ad sugar addicts as children, but um, I've never found that to be a problem for me. And that stevia's in stuff that I use, the ones with the least fat taste, um, I have never found that. Anecdotal. I've heard claims made that it balances blood sugar, but I don't know if there's substantial research behind that. Um, if you look up artificial sweeteners or even just Google them, um, it does say that they will uh, raise actually insulin levels in the body. So they do react with insulin. But stevia is not artificial. No, it's not, but it still acts with, it, it also reacts with monk fruit. Any sweetener, whether it's artificial or natural, will react with insulin. That is my understanding that the sweet taste itself triggers an insulin response. Uh, I've found that with people coming off hardcore sugar, which is almost everybody in recovery, uh, especially if you're coming from traditional like 12 step is that you can't ask somebody to have no sweet food in their diet. It's just not going to work. So I, I've successfully gotten quite a few people off of, I have them make a stash of something they like. I have a ton of recipes with monk fruit and it works like a charm. And then what happens I've noticed after that is because it's not feeding a candida and it's not disrupting so much is that then people's palates change. And then the sweet potato might with ghee butter on it might be, you know, like their treat after dinner with some nut butter or something like that. But it's, I, I mean, because I mean, if I sit down and tell somebody you can't have any sweet food, they're gonna <laughs> probably be like, yeah, right. So I don't know. I know it's not perfect, but 
my monk fruit desserts are like a hit and it, it seems <laughs> okay. So Jen, is the, is the monk fruit lower glycemic index? Is that why it's better than <laughs> the syrup and stuff? There is no glycemic index on monk fruit and it doesn't have a weird, or as far as I know, and it doesn't have any weird taste because a lot of people are like, oh, stevia is gross. Um, and so um, it, it tastes like real sugar. So if you're adding it into like a fruit smoothie for a dessert or something with protein powder and some like coconut oil, you know, it's a lot better than a Twinkie bar or the cookies that people are having at meetings or whatever. So um, I just wanted to add that in as far as like, the step down model <laughs> from sugar. I couldn't do that right away. You know, I can go without any sweet now, but at the beginning it wasn't possible for me. So can I ask um Sue so again about the artificial sweetener does what with your insulin? Does it activate your insulin to produce? I, I didn't quite that, yes that, that that is what the literature is saying is that in that it does activate insulin. It does. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I don't know if anybody's used, for instance, one of those continuous glucose monitors and has noticed what happens to blood sugar after you eat a artificial sweetener. I think that would be really, really interesting information. Oh. I have not seen any research that states that. I also haven't gone looking for it. But I think, you know, that that is a really important question to be asking. And I think the answer is it does. I mean, that would be the problem with it. But I have not read that research. Christina, when I used to teach um, a nutrition class on artificial sweeteners, um, it did say that... Um, what was I just going to say? We were talking about, what were we just talking about? I'm sorry. Artificial sweeteners doing what? Like, lowering, lowering blood sugar levels. Because there's, there's a lot of research out there that shows that people gain weight after they go on artificial sweeteners. Right. Oh, I was going to say one of the side effects of artificial sweeteners is actually uncontrollable blood sugar levels for aspartame and Splenda. Interesting. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, well, that's interesting because the people who take it are diabetic and are trying to manage blood sugar levels when in reality, mm -hmm. these things can actually cause them to become uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. just what I read. I, it's, you know, the consensus, and as I said, I have not, you know, really significantly researched this, but from what I've seen on the surface and hearing from other people, the consensus is that artificial sweeteners tends not to work either with diabetes or, or definitely seems to increase obesity, that there is a relationship between artificial sweeteners and gaining more weight. Now, whether that's 100% true, I, I can't sit here and stay because I haven't focused on it, but that is what I have run across. I, I think it creates confusion when artificial sweetener, when we say it, like say to a customer or they to, to a, like that's like aspartame and um, the Splenda ingredient, mm -hmm. right? It's right, as, as opposed to stevia monk fruit. Right. right. So if I am, if we include that under the umbrella, that's even if some parts they do like similar things. It, I don't know. I think that creates confusion. I think the aspartame and the um, Splenda ingredient are a pretty harmful. Like you know, studies with people having you know MS and different things. So I like to keep those separate, like the Splenda, other I mean, not Splenda, uh, monk fruit, et cetera, under not artificial sweetener, even though it might be artificial. Yeah. What do you think? That, that's, that's a really, really good point. So other than, um, oh. Well, oh. What, I, I just want to comment on what Heidi just posted in the chat. Oh, OK. And that there are studies that show that the liver of aspartame users is like that of an alcoholic. 
So, you know, that's another point to consider is how hard is it for the liver to detoxify these various alternative sweeteners? How's that, Sue? Various alternative sweeteners. Yeah. Um, because they are different in composition. Um, they do have the sweet taste. So how does the body respond to just the taste of sweet, period? That's one question. And the other question is, um, how do they impact the liver through detoxification? And how do they impact gut bacteria? So Sue just shared that some of these um, alternative sweeteners can artificial can adversely affect gut bacteria. So have they done that research with the stevia and the monk fruit and gut bacteria versus aspartame, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these are good questions that the answers may be out there, but I have not read them. Anybody else have questions, comments, success stories? I want to know who has successfully gotten yourself or other people off sugar. Laura? Yes, I, 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 I use stevia, but I don't use a lot of it. So, and I wasn't really addicted to sugar. I've known because of Doug Kaufman's work on the fungus link um, 20, how long ago has that been? 20 years ago. Um, I knew that it was really bad, um, so I've kind of avoided it, but mm -hmm. I definitely use stevia, and I buy chocolate with little, you know, I don't use a lot of, of uh, chocolate for comfort, but that's what I'm doing right now. That's right. I did have a question. Are there any precautions with DPA, with taking uh, DPA? Um, typically, no. No. Yeah. yeah. Typically, no, there may be a occasional, you know, idiosyncratic adverse, but typically no. Okay, because I, you know, I'm grieving, obviously, um, and I notice I use chocolate with sweetened with stevia for comfort, um, and I haven't really, because DPA seems to increase my migraines slightly, um, haven't taken a lot of it, but I really want to try because I, I, I am grieving and I notice I'm sad a lot more days than I should be. So uh, I'm going to try that. I'm going to take a lot of it. <laughs> and, and Laura, what you may want to do is do some very small doses more frequently and see if you can stay under that migraine threshold. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Christina? Yes. Are there any other of the uh, aminos that are helpful for sad and grieving too, or is it always just the D-phenol? Oh, that's a hard question to answer because grieving can be so complex. So for instance, when we're grieving, we can also have a drop in, you know, in dopamine production. And so we can just have this slow, sluggish depression, no motivation. We just don't want to move. Mm -hmm. And if that's the form that the grieving is taking, then bringing in the DLPA, bringing in tyrosine can help bring back life and enthusiasm and joy. Mm -hmm. You know, some people end up um, very anxious when they're grieving for a variety of reasons. And this is where bringing in either the GABA or the serotonin support can be really useful. So um, grief, grief, loss, loneliness, you know, these aren't, these aren't very narrow categories that just impact one neurotransmitter system. You know, we're very complex human beings and all of our neurotransmitters impact each other and especially impact dopamine at the reward center of the brain. So um, issues everywhere are likely to impact dopamine. Thank you. Christina, I have a getting off sugar story for you. Okay. Um, this was many years ago um, when I was younger, uh, went on a ketogenic diet 
Mm -hmm. And it literally took me two weeks to get the sugar out of my system. And there were times when the craving was so bad, I would go to bed just so I wouldn't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to say, once the sugar was out, my metabolism and my appetite, everything stabilized so much. It was amazing. Nice. And I don't know why I started eating sugar again, but I need to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's insidious. Sugar is really horrible. Sugar can be, but again, you know, we don't want to be black and white thinkers. Some people can tolerate a little bit of sugar without losing control, without it setting off this whole addictive process. Other people can't. Mm. I, you know, yeah, enjoy that would be me. See, I, en I enjoy ice cream. I like three spoonfuls. And then the ice cream carton sits in my freezer for a month. Everybody, excuse me just for one moment. Hi. So I can tell a story while Christine is on the phone. Oh, good. I was about to say, sorry about that. You guys can um, keep talking. So go for it. Okay. So I, I have two things. One is my own personal story of getting off sugar for a period of time. Um, and that was, I, I, I was doing like a, um, trying to get all the excess yeast candida out of my body and I did like an extreme diet like no grains no fruit no dairy of course no sugar um, and so I did this diet for a little over a year and what you know I was I, I, I lost 30 pounds from doing nothing else different in my life so that that was significantly huge i mean it was hard for me to not notice losing 30 pounds um and so and and just in listening to this conversation one of the things that i think about is the 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 difference in philosophies of getting someone off of a substance and and one philosophy that I know of is Joan Matthew Larson's philosophy of kind of like flooding the body with nutrients at the same time, taking the person off of all the substances that keep that reward deficiency pathway going. Um, so, and that's, I kind of like what I think I did in my own story um, I removed a lot. I didn't do the flooding of nutrients to the extent that Jones suggests. But I, and so my question is, well, I guess for the group or Christina or whomever, but that is the difference in philosophies of, you know, this taking someone off of all substances that could be feeding that reward deficiency pathway, as opposed to you know, just incrementally working with a client and like, try this, try this, try this kind of thing um, to help them. It, it's the difference between trying to cut down or eliminate. So that's my question. If, if anyone has some thoughts on that, I would appreciate hearing. I could, I, um, I would say, uh, because uh, 
I didn't mention originally that I am in long-term recovery also, because I, I always, every time I come to a Zoom meeting, I always have to stop myself and go, hi, I'm Elena, I'm an alcoholic. I always have to like, stop myself and go, hi, good morning, I'm Elena. So anyway, as far as like the recovery uh, people world goes, um, I think it depends on the person again, because that all or nothing mentality is a very kind of addict alcoholic mindset already uh, across like really, really strong. So, and so say, since I work in um, retail where my, my consultations, I have people now I've been, and families I've been working with for 13 years, but others are like, um, you know, you determine like, is this person just want appetizers or are, are they ready for the whole picture? So for the sugar thing, yeah. the little things I really always suggest is some form of, uh, I like the green powders. And if you can't handle the powder in some water, then tell them, you know, then do the capsules. It'll cost you more per serving. But if that's the only way you'll, those green powders are amazing mm. and they're, they're super amazing. And it's a small thing, but it has all the chlorophyll and those little micronutrients and, it, and it's the green stuff is simultaneously new to fine and gently detoxifying. Um, and the other thing that is also not very expensive because like not everybody has limitless um, you know, resources for purchasing these things, um, let alone access to them, is uh, really uh, the chromium, you know, 200 micrograms of chromium two or three times a day. A couple of days later, maybe three days, we go, to, like, my thing is bread. Like, what's not to like with bread? There's a bakery right across from our supplement department. I call it the other supplement. <laughs> bread, right? Anyways, um, the the chromium and the, the green the green powder. Uh, and, and frankly, even if I owned a juicer, I wouldn't have time to use it. Anyways, that's my two cents worth, chromium and green powders. Good for you, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, I had to step away for a moment, so it might have been already answered. I'm 51, and I've always had, um, I've always loved sweets, but I was never like a huge, like I didn't eat a lot of candy. I did like, I've always liked cake or dessert kind of stuff. But now at 51, postmenopausal, it feels like a switch has been turned on and it's like, it almost feels uncontrollable if I were to like the, and how I um, recognized this was a couple of Easter's ago, I was with my mother and she had a bowl of jelly beans. And I was the one person that loved the black jelly beans because I love licorice. And this has never happened to me. I only took a few. And after eating a couple, it literally felt like a switch turned on and I couldn't get enough. Mm -hmm. And I ate to the point where I got sick. And that's when I realized that something's up. This has to be hormonal. <laughs> and I don't know the first thing on how to or what to do to start to curb that because it's crazy. And I know that it's not healthy and it's toxic. And the older I get, it's like, I know I have to just get, uh, get uh, I don't buy certain things because I know that I'm going to eat, <laughs> eat it all like yeah, Oreo. Yeah, yeah. That's a wonderful story, Jennifer. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. And I think that's exactly, the, see, this is why we call you know, addiction biochemical. It feels like that a switch has flipped, something has changed biochemically and you've lost control yes and as human beings we get embarrassed and we feel ashamed and you know we feel guilty and all these really human feelings around loss of control but that's exactly what it means we no longer have control over it and we don't know why and we want it back um and and so this is where the very first thing you do is honor it is recognize it and then avoid it 
because this loss of control is real and it's not something we can generally, you know, willpower ourselves through. The other thing is to find out what's happened biochemically and maybe to get some testing, maybe to have your um, hormones tested, your thyroid tested, um, find out what's out of balance find out if your some of your neurotransmitters do need supporting, um, maybe bring in some chromium biotin and some of these other nutrients and see if, um, you know, some of those got shifted during menopause. Menopause throws everything out of whack. Mm-hmm. And it's the time in a woman's life and research has verified this, that it's the time in a woman's life when we are most likely to either relapse into an addictive behavior or start one when we've never had one before. Yes, and- I, I, well, just to be um, just open is that uh, this year marks um, 18 years uh, clean and sober for myself from alcohol and uh, pills, but I also know at 51 now, even though I don't do any of those things, caffeine, um, sugar, and the one thing that I do struggle with um, from, you know, on and off is nicotine. Those are the three. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be any addictions in my life, those are the three, and I struggle with it all the time. And what I do for my day job, I often feel like a fraud because I'm helping people with their health and wellness. And in my mind, I'm beating myself up because I have these issues and it's just a vicious mental thing that goes on with me. And, um, I don't, I don't know how to tackle one at a time. So I don't, it's, that's why it's overwhelming. So my mind is constantly going like 90 miles an hour. And I just found out that I have inattentive ADHD. So this is going to be, (laughs) Well, so Jennifer, first of all, I'm really glad that you're in the course because uh, we would be delighted to use you as a guinea pig if you'd be willing to. Yes, I would love it. (laughs) Okay. Um, See, because this is where we start out by looking at the chart and we start out by getting the nutrients in place, the amino acids in place, and then we see what changes, what that does. You know, I always take sort of a layered approach to to healing. Um, I'm going to just throw out a wild guess that for Jennifer, because she's just gone through menopause, it's not going to be as simple as bringing in amino acids because there's going to have been a lot of hormonal disruption. Um, And so we're going to have to find a way to identify and address what else is going on? So a quick story that has nothing to do with sugar, but has a lot to do with menopause is a former client of mine who came to me two years after her bleeding stopped, um, referred by her IOP counselor because she absolutely could not stop drinking. And not only couldn't she stop drinking, she also couldn't stop shoplifting. She had just gotten arrested for the third time in two years, I guess three years for shoplifting, and had just gotten a DUI and a charge of domestic violence behind alcohol use. Okay. Now, her father had died four years earlier, and she thought it was all due to her father dying, um, which, which may have been a factor because what the research, but the research says it's the two years before bleeding stops and the two years after bleeding stops that can be the most disruptive for women. And so all of this had happened in that four-year period, but most of it had happened in the two-year period since she'd stopped bleeding. And I asked her, I said, this is during the intake, um, when I began to put together the timeline, I said, well, have you had your hormones checked? And she said, yeah, well, I went to Kaiser last year, and they told me that everything was low, and I should probably go on, you know, 
hormone replacement therapy, but I really didn't like the doctor. And so I never went back. And I said, well, you got a choice with me because I honestly believe your hormones are a big part of the issue here because she had been shoplifting periodically before her whole life, but just a little bit and never gotten caught. She'd been drinking her whole life, but it had been under control. It had never caused a problem until her bleeding stopped. And I said, okay, I, I need you to go get your hormones checked. You can either go back to Kaiser and do what they say, or you can go to a friend of mine who's a functional medical um, nurse practitioner specializing in female hormones and recovery. And so she chose, she chose my friend who found that her vitamin D was low, mm. her thyroid was low, her all her hormones were low, and uh, th there were some other nutrients that were low as well, which would never have been discovered if we hadn't done the testing. She got on everything, her mood stabilized, her behavior stabilized, she um, was able to stop drinking and stay stopped, and she was able to, um, I mean, she was terrified to shoplift again because, you know, they were ready to put her in jail. And she didn't want to lose her teaching license. So both the nurse practitioner and I, after a couple of months, because she was being very compliant, doing everything we told her to do, and was really committed and was, had really stabilized beautifully, so both the nurse practitioner and I wrote a letter to her lawyer and to the judge expressing our belief that this out of control behavior was due to a medical condition as the result of menopause and these very depleted hormones and nutrients and that she was on everything, she was compliant, she was committed, and she was doing better, and would he please take that into consideration? And we, you know, put out the timeline in the letters and everything, and so the judge was very gracious and just sentenced her to community service rather than jail time. That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> Did she take synthetic hormones? Uh, no, she went on bioidentical. Okay. Yeah. It was a functional medical nurse practitioner after all. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. I just went off bioidenticals uh -huh. a few months ago. Okay. It was, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. Our body has to adjust. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I'm using... Um, a tincture now with black cohosh and some other herbs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's working think, real well. Yeah, I think herbs can be very, very helpful in just modulating um, hormone expression in the body. Yeah. What I discovered uh, that has helped me um, pre-menopause, like transitioning, the transition from um, the premenopausal and then after, like presently, mm -hmm. um, is I don't know if you've heard of it, but Shatavri root. Mm. And somebody suggested to me maca, um, which I know is very is usually something that I hear a lot about. But when I started taking that, it gave me a really bad headache. And so I knew that it was too strong for me. So I started looking into other herbs that can't because I purchased the book uh, The Wisdom of Menopause by Dr. Christian Northrup. Yeah, it's very good um, book. I gotta get that. Yeah, it's like it's been like my Bible because <laughs> mm -hmm. she covers everything, all the different choices. But I discovered shatavri root, which is um, in the in Ayurvedic medicine that they use that, and the mothers start the little girls when they start their their periods, and it and it's supposed to support hormone balance through a, all of the all of a mm -hmm. woman's stages. Would you and write I have, it, Jennifer? Could you write it in the chat, please? Yes. <clears throat> what I found, and I feel like I'm very lucky, I have not suffered from like night sweats. I've had them here and there, but it, I honestly felt like normal. I did not have like the irritability, the massive mood swings, all of the things that I heard people and other women tell me that they went through. 
And as long as I was taking that, I felt more like myself. I haven't taken it in a long time. And I realized that I need to be doing something again because I just kind of feel erratic. Mm -hmm. So I just started making notes of what I'm noticing. But that is something that I, I researched. And it translates to um, women of a thousand husbands. <laughs> so I don't know why, you know, I don't know the, the meaning behind that, but I just wanted to share that, that that has helped. All right. Well, Jennifer, thank you again. Please spell it out for us. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we call it a day? Just is, is her, are her covered in level two? I'm in level one. So yes, this will be covered in level two. Level two. Okay, good. Because I need to know. Well, both actually both sugar addiction and menopause will be addressed in level two. Excellent. So where, do you, where do you post these, uh, these conversations from Saturday? Um, in YouTube. Oh, it's a public. public. It's public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a quick question yep. about um, 5 HTP being used uh, premenstrually for women with their cycle still. Does it have an effect on uh, estrogen or progesterone or, or the, the, the reproductive hormones at all? And then, let me think about that one for a minute. Um, Typically, when estrogen drops, serotonin drops. So it's not the other way around, Heidi. It, it, it's not, I don't think, I've, I have not run across any research that indicates that raising serotonin will raise estrogen. But we do know that raising estrogen will raise serotonin. Does that answer that question? Okay, so... When estrogen drops, serotonin drops. So yes. we can support at least the serotonin with the 5-HTP, but the 5-HTP isn't necessarily supporting estrogen. Right, exactly. We, we don't just, know, in fact, that 5-HTP does, we don't know of any relationship of 5-HTP supporting estrogen, estrogen yeah. increase. That's right. I've we, got something okay. to... I've got something to um, contribute to that. Okay, go for it. Um, yeah, I personally take um, a um, semi and uh, DL phenylalanine and GABA for um, a chronic depression and anxiety that I've had since I was 18. Um, and when I became menopausal, um, and I tried going on um, estradot, which is estrogen replacement. The amino acids stopped working because mm -hmm. the estrogen was sitting on the um, receptor sites on the neurotransmitters. So I had to go back off the estrogen and in order for my amino acids to carry on working. And I had a real experience with that. It was, it was dramatic. And the, the changes going, um, taking the estrogen, being on the amino acids, having them not work, going off the estrogen, continuing to take the amino acids, and boom, they kicked in again. That's really, that's really interesting. Was that synthetic estrogen you were using or bioidentical? Bioidentical. Okay, because I had not heard that before, but that's really, really interesting information. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these are, this, this is information we may, we may not always understand somebody's experience, but we want to take it very seriously and stick it in our pot of really useful information to be considered when you run across somebody else who has the same experience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Melanie, you said Sammy, DPA, and what else? GABA. 
GABA. GABA, yeah, for the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now, when progesterone drops, there's a relationship between progesterone and GABA. So when progesterone ga drops, um, GABA tends to drop as well, which is why sometimes they will recommend um, progesterone, especially for postmenopausal women, for sleep. But sometimes just bringing in GABA will do the same thing. Kimberly? Did yeah, you? so I just wanted to go back to with sugar. Um, so we talked about there being some people who just can't tolerate it at all, kind of like alcohol. Right. They, mm -hmm. But for would you say it's most people that can, I mean, because to me to not have any sugar, how do we even define that? Fruit has a lot of sugar. Um, so I'm just curious, like how you work with your clients. There's a, there's a couple of different ways of thinking about that and answering that, Kimberly. Uh -huh. um, and it fits into the bigger carbohydrate tolerance question. Yeah. Okay. Because this isn't just about, you know, out of control sort of sugar binging and, you know, neurotransmitter depletion and all of that. This has to do with how your body handles um, simple and complex carbohydrates in general, how it does with energy sources. You know, this is where some people need to go keto and get away from carbohydrates as a source of um, energy at all. It, it, at least temporarily, even if not long-term. This is where heavy carbohydrate loading for a long period of time, you know, the standard American diet, growing up with sugar can have really wreaked havoc with our entire metabolism system. And so it's not an easy answer at all. The simple answer to this is um, everybody's different and everybody needs to listen to their own body and find yeah. out what they can tolerate and what they can't tolerate. Um, because, you know, we also have candida in right. the mix. Right. We've, got, we've got a lot of things in the mix. And so everybody has to get on their own individual journey but the very first step in everybody's journey, I believe, is to get off refined sugar, absolutely. Yeah. And then most people need to at least dramatically lower the rest of their um, refined carbohydrate intake. Anything that's going to jack your blood sugar, anything higher on the glycemic index needs to be avoided until you can figure out how to stabilize your metabolism. Um, okay. For some people, fruit jacks their blood sugar. For other people, it doesn't. But getting off refined sugar and getting off high fructose corn syrup is absolutely the place that everybody needs to start. Some people need to go way beyond that. Other people don't. Okay. So do you um, find it helpful at all to kind of set some targets with people mm -hmm. about reduction and... Absolutely. Um, absolutely. We set targets. And for people who can tolerate some refined um, carbohydrates, some refined sugar, you want to put the rule in if they should always be with fiber, fat, and protein. Mm -hmm. to slow down the absorption into the bloodstream so that, you know, again, blood sugar is not jacked up. And then you have the, you know, insulin surge and then blood sugar drops and then you have the adrenaline surge. And we want to avoid that. Our body wants a nice wave throughout the day. We want, don't want to be, you know, jumping around like jackrabbits. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for myself, like I try to stay to 50 grams or less because otherwise my candida flares. There you go. There you go. 
And so working with yourself and working with a practitioner to find out what your own parameters are. Mm -hmm. So all of the, um, we talked about protein, but obviously all the cofactors are important. Mm -hmm. All the cofactors are important, yeah. absolutely. And I, I know and that- Getting enough fat is, co is important. Yeah. I, know, I remember years ago learning that 5-HTP helped me control sugar craving. So for me, mm -hmm. I think it is largely a serotonin issue. Right. Because those just serotonin will um, create sugar cravings in many people. Mm -hmm. You know, the theory is that it it um, pushes tryptophan across the blood brain barrier to quickly raise um, serotonin levels. Okay. Yeah, you know, that that's the prevailing explanation for that. And, and um, candida, um, acts, you know, promotes those cravings for sugar. I know oh. when I go on a candida. Yeah that I don't crave sugar. <laughs> so it's those little beasts roaring in my body. Then <laughs> beep, beep. Yeah. How do you feel about um, raw honey? Well, raw honey is high on the glycemic index. Yeah. And so by itself is still gonna jack um, blood sugar. Okay. You know, there are good nutrients. Honey, honey is a good food. Honey is good medicine. So it needs, again, to be used in, in proper order, in proper context. And some people can't tolerate it at all. Other people can. And you really need to honor those differences in people. And grieve. If you're one of those who can't do any of it at all, that's a big loss. You know, I've been gluten-free for 35 years. I had to go off gluten before anybody even knew what the word was. That was a loss. I had to grieve it. Yeah, I miss my cookies, Christina. <laughs> I bet you do, Dylan. <laughs> the last um, time I tried to have sugar, I gained 80 pounds in five months. OMG. So that was like, okay, I'm not one of those who can have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you just, you know, you just, there are those who can't drink alcohol. There are those of us who can't eat gluten. I can't eat gluten, corn, soy at all. And I have to be really careful with eggs. Um, sugar is no longer an issue for me. It was an issue for me as a um, child and a young teenager. And then it stopped being an issue and I can take or leave sugar. And most of the time I leave it because I don't feel good on it. Um, most of the time I leave alcohol because I don't feel good on it. Um, you know, but you have to grieve. And then you move on. Because there are lots of us out there who can't eat certain things. And we should <laughs> refine carb cravings pretty much the same, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of clients who tell me they crave like the savory things more than the sweet, but they're eating a lot of bread and a lot of pasta and right. not enough protein. Exactly. I mean, so you've got to tease out, you know, people say, well, I really like salt. Well, what are you eating the salt in? Well, you know, it's not really the salt they're going for. It's the stuff they're putting the salt on. And we can, you know, want more salt. And often when we're, you know, our adrenals are being overworked, when we're in adrenal stress for a long time, we need more salt to support our adrenals. Mm -hmm. And that's real. Sure. And there are some people who think that most of us aren't, aren't eating enough salt. So it's a matter of, you know, what are you craving? Then you've got to ask yourself well, what is missing. So here we want to move into curiosity rather than self-attack. Curiosity rather than blame and shame. Distancing ourselves, becoming neutral, putting on our investigative hats rather than our beat ourselves up hats, because there's a reason why all of this is going on. And if we're beating ourselves up, 
then that's just continuing childhood, you know, um, uh, complex PTSD patterns mm -hmm. and not actually allowing us the freedom to get down to what's actually going on. But it's a sign that something's very out of balance. All cravings are a sign that things are very out of balance. And it's our job as human beings, especially, you know, in, in these arenas to without judgment, with curiosity and compassion, both for ourselves and other people, find out what's going on. All right, we are losing people. So I want to thank all of you for um, joining me and joining the community. And those of you who are new to the course, welcome. And I will see you all in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.